um, I'll go to the bigger screen when we're talking to the authors individually because um, I just don't <coughs> like seeing my face so big. <laughs> Simon's got his shield. I've got my little sword. I've got my tiny sword. <laughs> I'm pleased about that. Oh, if we're doing swords, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> You win. There's always a show off, isn't there? There's always a show off, and it's always Simon. Yeah, it right. is generally Simon. I'm, I'm just, I'm always armed. Okay, that's all I can yes. say. Right. So, thank you everyone for joining us to celebrate the launch of Hauntings, an anthology. It's a series of short stories, set historical fiction short stories, um, set to scare you. Actually, I don't think it's that scary. I think it's more psychologically scary than boo scary. Um, but there are an incredible series of short stories that are, every single one of them is fantastic. Unfortunately, um, Judith Arnott and Stephanie Churchill have had to give their apologies. They can't make it this evening. Um, but we have eight, the other eight authors here with us. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to each of them and then we'll get into the questions. So, um, kicking off the anthology was, is Simon James Atkinson Turney, the man with too many names, who has more novels than he can count, uh, about as many more novels than his names, which is quite impressive considering the number of names. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> other than Hauntings, he's got two other books out currently that are brand new, which is Gods of Rome by God, with him and Gordon Doherty, which is absolutely fantastic, Simon. I really oh, liked you. it, even though I knew what, what was coming at the end and I didn't like that, but I liked it. It was really good. And <coughs> Blood Feud, which is the first in his new Viking series. Next up, we have K.S. Barton, Kim, to friends, <laughs> <laughs> K.S. to um, readers. Um, who's given us a rather otherworldly Viking story in hauntings. Kim is the author of, is it three other books based on the Viking world, Kim? Yeah, yeah, three. Brilliant. And after that, we have the driving force behind Historical Writers Forum, our very own Paula Lofty, whose her short story is based in 11th century England, and she's published two books in her Sons of the Wolves series. Hopefully, finishing her haunting them. short story will prompt her to finish the third book so we can all yeah. read it, because we're waiting. <laughs> and next we have Jennifer C. Wilson. Is it Jen or Jennifer, Jen? It's Jen. Jen. I thought it was, <laughs> but I just wanted to do more Jen before I shortened your name. <laughs> um, who expands on her Kindred Spirit series in the anthology with a tale of of Death Among the Dead in medieval France, um, which was inspired by the dark deeds of a contemporary of Joan of Arc. <laughs> Jennifer's has written several books based on the Kindred Spirits and has written a number of medieval and time slip novels. After, Jen, after Jen, we get Lynn Dawson, who writes as Lynn Bryant. Did I get it the right way around this time? People will know me as Lynn Bryant. Yeah, Bryant and Lynn. Lynn writes her historical novels best set in the Peninsula War. Um, she's the female Bernard Cornwell, basically, and brings <laughs> us a mysterious tale of murder and PTSD in Hauntings, which is um, rather clever. I, I, I like them all, though. I can't keep saying I like that. I like that because I like them all. Um, then we have Kate Jewell, who is an almost newbie. Kate has won awards for her short stories in the past, in 2019, I think it was Kate, wasn't it? Yes, it was, yes. And the, um, um... her Here There Were Dragons um, hints at the promise of a fantastic novel we hope you're writing, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then we have the awesome Samantha Wilkinson, Wilcoxon who has written some fantastic Tudor fiction, her, what was it, Plantagenet Princess Tudor Queen. I know, I know I keep saying it, but I just think that is awesome. It's one of the best books I've ever read. Oh, and she you. has non-fiction book coming out next year, hopefully next year. Yes. <clears throat> and her, her haunting short story is set in an asylum in 1920s Michigan. 
And last, but by no means the least, and introducing... <laughs> where's she go? Oh, there she is, Danielle, she's next to me. <laughs> Danielle <laughs> Apple, who is our um, debut author in Hauntings. Not that you would know it from reading her story. It is absolutely incredible. Um, you would not know that she was not published before. So... Um, huge congratulations to Danielle for <laughs> such a clever, thought-provoking story, sitting in a hotel. Um, yeah, I loved it. So, um, what we shall do is, in order of authors, I'm going to go around each author and ask you for your inspiration behind your story. So, we shall start with Simon. And then we'll go to Kim because we know Kim might have to scoot off at some point because she has got another Kim, you engagement. Go first if you prefer. But no, we'll do Simon first because then you'll get us all laughing and. <laughs> or, or at least switch. Off. Hey! Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so over to Simon. What is the inspiration behind your story? Well, um, I've been for the last sort of three to four years, writing my first non-fiction book as well, because uh, I write a lot of historical fiction, mainly Roman Empire. Um, and I, I, I started, I got offered uh, to write a, a non-fiction. Um, and the subject we chose between myself and the, the editors was um, a general who any Roman fan out there might know, uh, Gnaeus Julius Agricola who is the man who is regarded as the conqueror of, of Northern Britain, the, the man who completed the conquest of Roman Britain. Um, so I spent years studying uh, Agricola's life, visiting all the sites that he was involved in, uh, hunting down anything appropriate in museums and so on, and reading Tacitus, because he is the only one uh, who has written a biography of Agricola before me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Tacitus was Agricola's son-in-law, and he wrote essentially what is, it's a political statement, it's a eulogy, it's a, a bitch fest against the Emperor Domitian, it's a history, it's all sorts of things, but it's it's a great book, whatever else happens, and there is there are a few scenes in it, it's a battle scene that it is, it, any historical fiction author would absolutely love to have written. Uh, it's, it's blood and mud and stink and metal and screaming. And, and this is from a Roman author at the time, and it's, it's in a biography. And I thought, wow, this is really good. Our decadence. He's really good at what he does. And when you get to this, this point where um, Agricola, and this is in, in two of his stories, it's, it's, it's in the annals as well as the, uh, as the Agricola. He tells the story of the uh, suppression of the Druids on Anglesey which is under a, a, a different general, but at the time Agricola is serving as a senior officer in his, in his army. So I was studying this and I went and I, I stood on the, what is now presumed to have been the Roman embarkation point to cross uh, the Mediterranean <coughs> to, to Anglesey. And I went and I tromped around Anglesey around where the battles were supposed to have happened. And I, I it's a fascinating uh, subject, a fascinating moment in history because it's the moment that the Druids, now, you, you, barring in these these sort of strange blokes in white clothes who wander around Stonehenge going, ooh, who like to think they're Druids, uh, nobody actually knows what the Druids were because the Romans stamped them out in 61 AD. There is There was no surviving record. There is no surviving Druidry. So... It, it's a fascinating moment. This this moment where where the druids are gone, resistance is destroyed under the Roman boot. But what gets this tale uh, is is what st started this tale is a moment in Tacitus's writing where he describes when the Roman army arrives across the water. They, they come across in makeshift rafts. The German cavalry are swimming alongside their horses in their armour, holding onto their horses. Um, it, it's, it's a really, it's a proper saving Private Ryan moment of, of, of where they where they arrive on the island, and the, the the Celtic natives are there, whipping out you know weapons into the water, and the, the Druids are exhorting the tribes to rise against them. Ah, fires burning, <laughs> clashes, everyone's shouting. 
But he describes, among these other things, the, the, the women of the British tribes. Now, you don't get a lot of women described in Roman writers, not in um, active roles at the very least. And these, these, are the, these, these Celtic women are described as like furies, dressed in black, cavorting among the men, screaming and, and uh, like demons, uh, exhorting them to war. I thought, oh, oh God, that's a horror story waiting to happen, that is. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that, that's that, that was the influence. That's where it's come from, and I, I, I I've built everything up based on the idea in, in my story. I don't know; people may have read it, they may not. Have, but the idea is that the aging general who started this this conquest of Anglesey ten years later is beset by demons for having wiped out this culture, and essentially. This is only the second time in, well, it's, it's the first of only two times in Roman history where a Roman general has gone to war against gods because the Romans are very superstitious. Uh, they destroyed the temple in Jerusalem under Titus. Um, that's one. And they suppressed the Druids and stamped out the, uh, the Druidry in Anglesey. And that's two. It's the only time the Romans ever went to war against gods. And it must have been terrifying for them. Yeah, I totally agree. I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, it, because they are really religious, aren't they, the Romans? They, they seem to um, gather gods rather than um, hide from them or anything. They just they're happy to gather as many gods as they can, from what I can tell. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you, Simon. So shall we go on to Kim and um, find out your inspiration? Oh, OK. So mine wasn't like from a, a particular story or anything like that. Mine was kind of pieced together from different things that I'm interested in. So since I write in the Viking Age, I thought, well, of course, you know, over the course of my studies, I've come across the, the Norse, what they call ghosts, but they're actually zombies. They're called Draugr or Optergangr. And uh, they're really horrifying creatures and nobody wanted to encounter one. They're just absolutely terrifying. So my, I, it began with like, okay, I need to write my ghost story that is around these Draugr. And, and they're, so the reason I call them zombies is because they actually had, anim they were animated corpses and they had corporeal bodies. So they weren't ghosts. They were, you know, they were like walking around undead and they were horrible, terrifying creatures that would like attack people and kill people. It, humans and livestock were found like with all the bones in their bodies smashed by these creatures. They were enormous, bloated, heavy creatures. Their skin was described as hellblar, which means like death black or death blue. And they could curse you. They could turn you into one of them. And I mean, they were just absolutely horrifying. And, and they were also very difficult to kill. In one of the, the sagas, they had to, they killed the Draugr and they, they had to behead it, burn it, and then go and throw its ashes into the sea before they were confident that it was actually gone. So that was kind of what I started with like, oh, I need, I need them in my story because ugh, they were horrifying. And then, but I needed some place to put them. And the, there's like all these uh, stone ship circles in Scandinavia, particularly Sweden. And unfortunately I haven't ever seen one that's, that's on my bucket list of things to do. And I've loved like burial mounds and these, these stone monuments and stuff. So these stone ship circles, think, think Stonehenge only smaller and shaped like a Viking ship, a, a long ship. So I picked, I looked at pictures online and I thought, well, I could do one that's like an overgrown small stone circle that's like in the woods somewhere that'd be kind of spooky and creepy. But then I really liked um, Ale Stenar, which is King Ale's, Ale's stones in Southern Sweden because it's on this plain uh, this bluff overlooking the sea. And it, it, to me, it spoke of like a fantastical story, less claustrophobic and spooky and more like 
dramatic. And so I just thought, oh, I just, I just looked at pictures and more pictures and did like Google Earth things. I'm like, this is, this is like a really neat place. And it's, it's called King Ale's Stones because there's a legend that this mythical Swedish king is buried there, even though there's really no evidence that he is. So I thought, well, I'll take his name and I'll just create a different legend for him. And they've also discovered a burial mound like underneath the stones that's maybe like 5,000 years old where the stones are only like 1,400 years old. So I kind of combined the burial mound, the stones, and then I needed like one more thing to kind of blend them all together. And then I thought, well, the Norse sagas and stories are just filled with curses. People are always cursing other people. They're cursing their objects. I mean, Tolkien got his one cursed ring. I think he took it from a, a, Nor a Norse story where there's a cursed ring that anybody who owned that ring would pretty much die. So... <laughs> So I thought, oh, what a curse. So I decided, you know, okay, now I had some cursed sailors that would be on this, you know, on this burial mound stone ship. And, and they're plaguing a nearby fishing village. So that's kind of, I just, I don't know. It wasn't like one inspiration. It was just like all these little pieces. It was like a magpie, like, okay, I'll take this and this and this and this. And then since I always like to have uh, women in my Viking stories, since so many Viking stories are only about the men, I'm like, there are women in that world. And some of them weren't fighters or shield maidens. Some of them were just regular women. So I decided to throw my poor, unfortunate protagonist, Asa, literally wash her up ashore by this fishing village where there's this cursed, these cursed sailors. So, and either she's going to be a key to solving the problem or she's going to make the problem of these cursed sailors worse. So that's basically how I just kind of pieced it all together. It, look, it works really well, Kim. And I oh, do thanks. like how you've got the book in, in the corner just behind you. It's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much, Kim. And that is... I, I can't say it is one of the best stories in the book, but then every single story is one of the best stories in the book. <laughs> um, so over to Paula and um, uh, rather um, amazing story. Um, I think it's really well done about um, two brothers after a battle basically but she'll tell you the rest Paula. So um, I hope I'm looking suitably scary with my darkened room. <laughs> I'll try not to frighten you too much um, but yeah so um, when I you know when we sort of were talking about um, doing this um, anthology of ghost stories um, I thought to myself what can I write about you know then um, I thought, well, I write in the Anglo-Saxon period, I write in the 11th century, um, what could I do? There was lots of things I could do. I could do something around, you know, the Battle of Hastings, maybe ghosts coming from that. Um, but I suddenly realised that in my own book, when I was doing some writing, um, that uh, I, I write about a, um, a family, basically. It's based around this family um, and the, the father is the main character and then um, he has various children and, and there were two brothers in, well, there's three brothers actually, but one's kind of not in this story. Um, and um, one of them dies and uh, I thought, what if the dead brother, well, he dies in rather tragic, uh, suspicious circumstances. Um, he dies in battle. And um, but the, the family, there is a blood feud between this family and another family uh, who live nearby. And um, they're convinced that um, this is not a normal battle saying This was something that happened during the battle um, in the guise of a battle saying, um, but it was actually murder. And. Um, oh, that's weird. We've just got Lynn. <laughs> Things just come up on my screen. Is anyone else? Oh, there she is. Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'll go back to, um, I got distracted there. 
Um, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So, um, I've lost my train of thought now. What was I talking about? Um, so, yes. Yeah, so they, they think that this this um, battle slaying of, of one of the brothers, it, but, uh, one of the twins, actually, um, isn't actually you know a normal sort of death by battle. It's a uh, it's a murder. And uh, as I said, you know, they suspect that it has something to do with the um, the father whose name is Wolfear. Um, in fact, all, two brothers are called Wolf something as well, but I won't go into that right now. But because um, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just confuse you. But Wolfear, um, he, he has this, you know, ne- what he, who he sees as his nemesis, um, Helgi, who is his enemy, arch enemy, and has threatened his family in the past. So they they really truly believe that this was, you know, a, a murder rather than a um, a battle slaying. And um, I thought, what if the brother who had been killed started haunting the brother that was alive, who is actually quite broken by the loss of his brother, um, by the way. And, um, you know, if the brother was like, sort of, he, he, they were so close being twins that um, it was quite natural for him to talk to him, even if he wasn't there. And so he starts talking to his brother um, and then his, you know, his brother sort of appears to him and starts haunting him and, and, and sort of you know, saying, you've got to find out who killed me, you know, otherwise I'll never, I'll never get justice. I'll never um, get, you know, um, get, I want you to get me, I want you to avenge me. And I thought this would be a really good story to write about for the anthology because, you know, it's, it, it's a spin off from my um, series. Um, Sons of the Wolf and it also gives me the opportunity to take a character who was a little more of a secondary character um, in in the book rather than um, his other brother who um, Tovey who is the one that is more popular and I thought it was a chance to give him a bit of a spotlight and um, you know show, show the readers a little bit more and for me to learn a bit more about him as well so, um, so I've written this story about his brother haunting him, and um, you know, he he eventually he through a series of um, terrifying um, events that happened to him. I mean, he can't understand why his brother's actually sort of scaring him because you know his twin brother wouldn't have done that. But um, it's it's you know it's a lot more sinister than that. And so um, he does eventually find out who has killed him, or he thinks he he thinks he 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 has in a series of terrifying events. And um, there's a bit of a twist at the end, but um, I won't go into that. But yeah, that was the inspiration really for me um, be, behind my my story. Thank you, Paula. Um, the howling of the bull, by the way. There's a fabulous twist at the end, and I did not see it coming. <laughs> Oh, well done with that because I was like oh my <laughs> how'd you come back from that <laughs> so next up is Jennifer C. Wilson oh excuse me my microphone just went funny um yeah so Jen would you like to tell us about yours yeah certainly so um my story in the book is um Kindred Spirits the Monster of Mashkul um I always say I don't write ghost stories. I write stories about ghosts because I'm the biggest coward you will ever meet. Um, and I'm quite frightened of lots of things. Um, but for a challenge a couple of years ago, we were doing a Halloween reading as part of the writing group. And I wanted to try writing something a bit darker in the Kindred Spirits world. Um, so for those who don't know the Kindred Spirits world, it's the ghosts of historical characters, but in contemporary settings. So we visit places like the Tower of London, Westminster Abbey, um, Edinburgh, a whole array of places. Um, and I wanted to write something a bit darker. So I started thinking, what would a ghost be frightened of? Um, and in, in the world of Kindred Spirits, there is something called fading, which is where a ghost can be killed or at least physically harmed and gradually weakened and it got me thinking who who could do that I think that was something that a ghost would be frightened of because it can happen 
instantaneously as a simple result of an injury, or it can happen over many years. And I really like the idea of a sort of serial weakening ghost, a serial fading ghost, um, basically tormenting towns, people, villages, and eventually a country. Um, and a friend suggested Gil de Rey, the Baron de Rey. Um, you mentioned earlier that he had been a companion of um, Joan of Arc. He was very highly honoured at the court of um, King Charles in France. And he was made Marshal of France, so a very well respected, well thought of character um, at the French court. But I think the, the power went to his head, it became corrupted, became spend, started spending money on lots of things, um, trying to increase his power um, more and more. And eventually that turned into dabbling in alchemy. And beyond that, he started to essentially try and summon demons. Um, and get involved in uh, sort of, I think the, the phrase would be a black mass of sort. Um, and essentially he started murdering people and not just murdering people, murdering children. Um, he's probably the only character I've ever really felt uneasy writing about. Um, absolutely vile, vile character, um, but perfect for the story. So I started to explore a little bit more about him and I wanted to see how the ghostly community might react to having such a monster in their midst. Um, and I, I can't tell you exactly how they react to it, but um, they, we do see a lot of teamwork between the ghosts. Um, we start in the 1440s and move mm -hmm. all the way to the present day. So we have a real range of characters. Um, which is something I really like about the uh, to have medieval people talking to World War Two, World War One, and two soldiers, things like this. Um, so yes, we have uh, a final battle scene, and um, yeah, that's I think that's probably quite a bit about the story. That's brilliant, thank you, Jen. And it, it really is; it's a fascinating story. I love the way it, it develops, and um, yeah, it was um, again, it was another unique story. I keep saying that, but they're all so different. I can't believe how different they all came up. And um, Lynn, who is up next, she took us a little bit further forward, past the medieval period, and into the Peninsular War um Portugal, wasn't it, Lynn? Um, yeah. So what made you come up with this story? Yeah, I mean, this story is a, is a bit of an odd one, really, because normally you can sort of find a, a very general inspiration for things. But this one is very specific to me. Um, I mean, I've written I, this is not my first ghost story. I, I have a tendency. I write several short stories that I give out free to readers every year um, at particular times. So I always do one at Christmas, one on Valentine's Day and one at Halloween. Sometimes I do the other one in between. But those are the three usual times. So I've done several Halloween ghost stories and they are all based in or around the Peninsular War period because that's what I write. But this one was slightly different because I, I had this very weird coincidence happen to me earlier this year at the time that I was trying to think about what I was going to do for the ghost story for hauntings. Um, and I I've recently, this year, sort of started putting my books out in paperback. They've, they've mostly been done on Kindle so far. Um, and the early, the, the first book in the series, um, An Unconventional Officer, I ordered several paperbacks that came back with a printing error in them. Um, so it was a very obvious, it's only one line, so it really doesn't spoil the books that much, but it's obviously they're not fit for sale um, or, you know, so... I, I had the I got them replaced um, from the the printer, but there I had about I think about half a dozen of them. Um, over here we have a, a local Facebook group which shares books to give away. Um, it's a really nice idea. So I thought I'll just put these books up and say if anyone's interested in a free copy of these books, you know I can identify what the printing error is. But other than that, and I had quite I had quite a big take up of it, which was really nice. Um, I met a couple of very interesting people through this who said they were interested in my books. And, you know, sort of I met up with them and had a chat. But there was one lady that contacted me. And if anyone can hear an awful noise, that's my dog crying in the background. And I need to let him out because otherwise he'll howl. So one second. And I'm so sorry. Oscar, you're a pain. Go. 
Right, I'm back, I'm back. Just pretend that that didn't happen and that I'm incredibly professional here. Anyway, uh, one lady contacted me and said that she'd like a copy of the book for her husband, who was very interested in the Peninsula War because one of his ancestors was an officer serving under Wellington. When the chap came round to collect the book, he told me this amazing story about his ancestor, who was indeed an officer. Uh, it was an Irish guy called Waldron. And he got into trouble a fair bit during the war over his relationships with local women. Um, the first inst instance was he had an affair with the wife of one of his NCOs, which is, of course, completely not OK. Um, he got into big trouble about this because when the, I think it was a sergeant, turned up to claim his wife back, his wife by then had moved in with this officer, the officer got into a fight with him um, and basically did, did him some injuries. So there was a court martial. Um, he wasn't cashiered, but he got into some trouble over that. Um, and there were there were some penalties. Later on, he then met up with a young Portuguese girl um, at, I think it was at a church service in her family's chapel. And apparently they fell in love. They decided that they wanted to be together and he eloped with her. Her parents were completely furious about this because she was a very high born Portuguese girl. She'd only recently come back from spending some time at school in a convent and her parents had a marriage ready arranged for her. She ran off with this good looking young Irishman. The parents were utterly furious. Um, and there is actually, there are letters in um, some of the Wellington collections between Wellington and her family because they complained to Wellington about what had been done here and basically said that they wanted the girl returned. Wellington did a very Wellington thing in the sense that he tried hard to appease the parents, but went away, investigated and discovered that the couple were legitimately married. So went back and said, I'm really sorry. I understand you're upset, but there's literally nothing I can do because they're married. Um, end of story. Um, the parents made a number of threats. Um, they wanted to have, according to their law, because he had eloped with their daughter, the officer in question would have been subject to transportation and they threatened to kill their daughter if they saw her again. So the, the story came out of that, really. I mean, actually, the couple went back to Ireland um, it was decided that he was better away from the peninsula given, given this situation. Um, so they were out of the picture. But I was left with this story of what was in effect a threatened honour killing. Um, obviously, there were relationships between Portuguese and Spanish women and British officers who were out there for lengthy periods of time away from their home. Some of them went very well. I mean, there's a very famous story that Georgia Hay wrote about of Harry and Juana Smith, who were an incredibly devoted couple. Um, but there were obviously other relationships that were less permanent. But in the middle of that, I was trying to visualise how it might go if there was a, a family whose daughter had got together with an officer or, a, you know, a, a soldier of some kind. And maybe it was a matter of honour and maybe it was made even worse if the officer wasn't an allied officer, but was a French officer and what they might do about that. And that's kind of where the idea came from. It came out of a true story. That's brilliant, Lynn. Brilliant. That's it. I didn't realise that was a true, true story. That's quite amazing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the ancestor, the, the, the descendant of, of this original couple lives on the island with his wife. Um, she never went back to Portugal, actually, I think because she was afraid of what her parents might do. But her daughter did go back to to. Um, the peninsula um and that's who he's descended from so wow that's wow. a great story to have in the family annals isn't it yeah very yeah. much so and i was so excited to discover it has he read the haunting story then has he read it 
Um, I don't know how if he has yet, but but they have got a copy, so I'm hoping that he will. Um, I mean, he knew I was even knew I was going to write it. Um, oh, obviously, it's it's slightly different. It's a different part of the country, and you know, the ending of the story is very different. And it was a French officer rather than an, an Irish officer. But the the principle behind it is just a what if. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic inspiration, Matt. I like that. Um, Kate, yours was, I think, the only story that actually had a dragon in it. Yes. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> so what was the inspiration? Where did the dragon come from? <laughs> I, when I started thinking about what I was going to write, um, I was finding it really difficult because I've never written a ghost story before and I don't really read ghost stories. And I'm, I was thinking, well, I'm moving down to the West Country um, and I know Dartmoor pretty well because I've got relatives in Plymouth. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll look up some of the myths and legends about things on Dartmoor and see if I can come up with anything and found that, you know, there's loads of small stone circles in on Dartmoor and there's all sorts of myths going round about them, why they're there, all these stone circles. So I was going down that route and I wasn't getting anywhere. And I was staying with my daughter and her husband in Somerset while I was looking for a house to buy down here. And it was, I think it was, it wasn't, it wasn't New Year's Eve. I think it was a, a little bit nearer Christmas than that. We were all really bored because of all the um, lockdown business and everything and trying to keep our distance from everybody over Christmas and what have you. And we decided we'd go out for a walk. And my son-in-law asked my grandson, where would he like to go? What, and he said, he was um, three, he's three. And he said, I'd like to go to a forest. So Gareth um, said, oh, I know where we go. It's not very good. We'll go to uh, the Roche Forest. Um, so we got into the car and we drove off to this place and it was a miserable day. It was wet, cold no sunshine or anything and I thought oh, we're going to walk around a forest in the in this miserable weather and I'm a really I'm a fine weather person you know I like going out when it's fine not when it's miserable and wet anyway we got to this um, forest parked up in the car park it's it's owned by the um, forestry commission um, and it, I thought oh, it was interesting because it's not your typical forestry commission forest which is full of um, conifers and things like, you know, fast growing conifers and things. Anyway, we parked up and we walked through this sort of break in a, a bank and suddenly we were in this clearing and there was an information board in the middle of this clearing, which told us that this was the site of a, an Iron Age fort. And it, over the years, this had been developed by the Romans as a, a base, um, you know, for soldiers and that. Kind of and it was built up as a Cotton Bailey Castle in the um, in um, in the eleventh um, uh, century, uh, just after the uh, the Battle of Hastings. And then it was in, it was enlarged in the in the twelfth century, well, during the Anarchy, which was the civil war between Stephen and Matilda. Um, and I, I was thinking, oh, is this that? Because sounds really interesting. Anyway, we started walking around down into the forest and the tracks are really steep and, the, and it's all mixed woodland. So it's not all conifers. And there were all these trees with no leaves on, but they were dripping with ivy and lichens and and all sorts of greenery that was just hanging off them. And it, even though it was such a dull, horrible day, all this greenery was really vibrant green. It wasn't, you know, dull and boring looking. And we were wandering down this track and Evan suddenly said, my grandson suddenly said, oh, look, what's that? And went charging off down this really steep track and we all charged off after him. And there were two dragon carvings either side of the path. And they'd been carved, I found out later, by a guy who does chainsaw wood carvings. And he'd been commissioned to carve these two dragon heads 
either side of the track when they cut away the trunk of a fallen tree that had blocked the path. And I suddenly started thinking, oh, that's interesting. And I thought, actually, you could have a really good ghost story through all this mysterious landscape. And when, when we got back home, I started doing a bit of research about Castle Naroche and the, the Roche Forest. And I found out all sorts of interesting things. And I also found out that Somerset has got, is only one county in England that's got more dragon stories than Somerset, and that's Yorkshire. And um, a guy, um, Brian, it is Brian, isn't it? Brian Wright has written a fantastic book about the dragons of Somerset. So I rushed over to eBay and found a copy of it and bought it. And I was fascinated because a lot of the places in Somerset have got more than one dragon myth. And Castle and the Roche was one of those. There was, there's several, when you go on the internet, there's several different tales with dragons to do with, um, to do with uh, Castle and the Roche. And then on my internet searches, I came across a lot of early papers to do with Castle and the Roche for the um, Somerset Archaeological and Natural History or something like that. Like that. It's called Natural History Society. And the most detailed one on Castle and the Roche in the middle of the 19th century was written by a Reverend F. War, and it's spelled W-A-R-R-E. And I was reading this, I was thinking, this is really interesting all about this. And he ended his paper, his really serious academic paper, with an anecdotal story about treasure hunters looking for the dragon's treasure in the cave under the, the mott mound on the actual castle. Um, and I suddenly thought, I well, suppose there was somebody from that era, you know, back in the, um, in the 12th century, that could come back as a ghost, something to do with a dragon story and all that sort of thing. And so I, 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 there's a farm that's a farm that's actually built in the old Outer Bailey yard of the now non-existent castle. It's just all the mounds and a bit of few stone remains and things there. But there's actually a working farm that's built there that's a Vic, um, Victorian farmhouse. And I thought actually you could have somebody based in that farmhouse that's being haunted by a ghost from what was going on back in the um, 12th century. And things were starting to pull together. So I thought, and I could actually have this Reverend Ware come in as, um, as one of the characters, a supporting character in the story. And that's where it all started, really. I had a, I had a venue for it. Um, I had two, you know, two places which were the same place, but 700 years apart. And I had um, a supporting character with this academic Reverend guy who obviously had a great sense of humour because of this anecdotal reference he did at the end, end of his very dry academic paper. Um, and I thought I could have the farm, farming family, the daughter could be the one that's going to meet, be, you know, be haunted by this ghost or whatever. Uh, I had a sort of antagonist, which was the dragon from the myth that was apparently buried all this treasure under the mound at uh, Carson, the old castle in the rock and then I had to go in on in search of a ghost and that's where that's where it all came from really and I was amazed that I actually managed because I said to Paula didn't I, I said to you that um, I'm not going to be able to write 10,000 words which was what the suggestion was because I just won't I won't be able to do it you know as a short story in 10,000 words and I was amazed because then I about uh, just before the deadline came for us to send all our stories through. I, I said to Paula, help, I've gone way over 10,000. So I got really carried away with it. I was amazed. And you you pulled off such a wonderful story, Kate. I really enjoyed reading it. And like I said, he was the only dragon in the book. So it's like, yay, yeah. dragon! Well, unfortunately, I can't, I, I can't persuade him to come out from under the bed. He's, he's, he's very <laughs> shy, this dragon, and he... He's, he's hiding under my bed. And as you suggested, I ought to 
um, tempt him out with snacks, but all he said was he'd probably end up eating all the participants of the meeting instead. <laughs> but no, I, he's, he's still hiding under my bed. Oh, bless him. Thank you very much, Kate. I love that story. I love the way you oh, pulled you. it all together. Um, next up, Samantha and your um, lunatic asylum story. I love that. It was oh, like, oh, I don't know how this is going to happen, but it was one of those that I couldn't wait to read. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, so when Paula brought up this idea, Paula has lots of ideas. If any of you don't know her very well, she's always throwing stuff at us, but she has lots of good ideas. Um, and so when she said ghost stories, I kind of thought to myself, I don't write ghost stories. I don't have a single idea what to do with that. Um, so I just started, you know, trying to think of what, what I would do with that. What ghost stories have I even read myself that I enjoyed? And um, the only ghost stories that I could think of that I had really read were things like Edith Wharton and Afterward and, you know, where it's it's kind of like you said, scary and not kind of a horror movie kind of way, but in what you realize has happened after the fact. Um, so I decided to try and do something like that. And um, initially I thought, well, I'll base it uh, kind of around the characters of my last novel, which was Luminous and is about the Radium Girls in um, Ottawa, Illinois. So I kind of started something like that and it wasn't really, it wasn't working for me. And I started worrying that, well, if people read this, will they think Luminous is a ghost story then? And they'll go pick that up and they're going to be very disappointed if they are expecting a ghost story because it's not the same thing at all. It's, you know, about what really happened to the Radium Girls in Ottawa. And anyway, so I had just happened to also recently have been on a little family weekend trip up to Traverse City, Michigan, which for those of you who probably don't know, since you don't live in Michigan, I have to have my little Michigan glass here, so I can't see myself very well. But I live like down here in Michigan at the bottom and Traverse City is up here. So it's up north as we call it around here. And, um, it was in the fall, so you know, all the, the changing colors and everything, just like now, it was almost exactly a year ago. And there's a place in Traverse City, which now is called um, the village at Grand Traverse Commons. And what was originally built as the Northern Michigan Asylum, it's also called Northern Michigan State Hospital, um, to be an asylum in the late 1800s. So uh, my children will tell you that anywhere we go, whether it's related to something I'm writing or not, I find a historical site to drag them to everywhere we go. So that was where, um, where we went on that weekend. And they're working on a renovation project there. So some of the buildings are, um, you know, they've been fixed up to look like they did that. And I mean, it's a beautiful place. Um, and I mean, Traverse City in general is beautiful. If any of you know, there's the bay there. It's, it's very pretty. And um, anyway, so some of the buildings were fixed up and there's shops and apartments and things in them now, but some of the buildings aren't. And they're still, they've torn some down. They're trying to decide what to do with some others, but they offer these tours, which was excellent because they take you on these tours through these dilapidated old asylum buildings and as a writer you can't help but have your imagination inspired by walking through these old asylum buildings and you can imagine how how pretty they once were but also it's you know there's a dark kind of sinister feeling there too you know there's no electricity we're all using the lights on our phones and stuff and especially when you, they took us down in some basements and stuff. And so it's dark and there's graffiti because people have broken in. So there's broken glass. And so there was just a lot of, um, uh, a lot of contradictions in, in visiting there with the, the, the beauty, both natural and the architecture, and then this dilapidated part also. But then, and I, this was something I did kind of know was coming, but it couldn't really be prepared for. Um, until we were there, they have these steam tunnels and they're 
um, kind of like the back of the book, which I don't have it with me, I should, but the back of the book is kind of based on one of my pictures of the steam tunnels at the asylum. And they don't actually have water running down the middle of them like it does on there, but um, they're tall enough to stand up in and they run under these buildings for miles. And they're these big brick tunnels, which is how they um, pumped heat into the buildings rather than having used fireplaces in an in insane asylum. So, um, so you can go down and walk around in them. Of course, they're not used to heat it anymore, but they're there and they, they let you tour them. And it was just something I knew I needed to use as a story element. So spoiler alert, sorry, but um, <laughs> so um, what I decided to do is I used the 1920 setting, which is the same as um, my story luminous. So I, I kept the same era and I did have um, one of the patients kind of makes a little offhand remark about having a painting that their niece used some glow in the dark paint on. So I give, I give luminous a little hint and it's, it's at the same era, but um, the rest of it is all, I just um, kind of tried to think of, like I said, an Edith Wharton style story. So there's a young nurse and she's um, you know, trying to solve a little mystery, but um, the end kind of happens in an unexpected way and danger comes from some unexpected um, directions rather than maybe what she was thinking she was going to find. So that was, that was my inspiration. And it is awesome. It's a brilliant story, Samantha. And next up, we have our debut author, Danielle. Huge congratulations to Danielle for her first published short story, um, which is um, another unique story. I keep saying it, don't I? I know, but these these stories are all awesome and all deserve to be read. And Danielle is you would not know that this is her first publication because it's just so well put together, so very clever. I love the thing with the mirrors and things, Danielle. So tell us your inspiration. Wow. OK, that was a really great intro. <laughs> um, I well, first of all, I feel really honored to be with all of these authors who've already published and they have such amazing bodies of work already. Um, I'm just me working on my novel series and writing short stories to uh, give myself a break. <laughs> but this started as a, a contest entry for a group called Literary Ladies, and the theme was love. <laughs> and I had the hardest time writing anything romantic. So... I started going through my list. I have a list of story ideas that I just keep and I flip through them every once in a while. And this one I came across, I thought I could do something with it. And basically, in my hometown, there is a hotel that they say is haunted. And the ghosts move furniture around is one of the main complaints. And I thought, well, <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if my ghosts were not scary? They were just really annoying. So I just kind of went down that road. And yes, the Holbrook Hotel is my inspiration. But <laughs> uh, since my favorite thing to write is gothic historical fiction, I, I kind of struggled going between that and love and humor but I think it all worked out pretty well. Um, what was I going to say about that? I, I, was, I was challenging myself, is it really? And I figured if I took a ghost from my favorite time period, that would be Nancy. She'd be in the earlier 1800s. And I moved her forward to as far forward as I could go to like the 1960s. I thought it could be very interesting. And what actually came out of the whole thing was a study on people in their lives currently. And I think it's just a relatable story. So for me, the hotel kind of represented how people build their lives and they take things for granted. They have old habits that 
used to help them survive that no longer serve them. An example of that could be the vines that were once planted to prevent soil erosion now consume the hotel. And it's gotten so bad that the main character tries to twist the vines around each other so they grow a different way, but it's too late. I mean, they've already taken over. And as far as the mirrors, um, the, his wife is trapped in the mirror and the mirror keeps her in a transitory state. It's, let's say it's purgatory, but it's more like she made a, a bad decision and she wanted to not live. But while she was in the mirror, she was afforded that chance to do some thinking. So she can glide from mirror to mirror throughout the hotel. That's her mode of transportation. And there's one point where her husband wonders, you know, did he put the mirrors where they are at her bidding? Like, did she want the mirrors there? Or did he put them there to direct where he wanted her to go? Because he had a really hard time accepting um, her freedom, her desire for freedom. And ultimately, it was that struggle that um, got her out of the mirror. He decided that she deserved to be happy whether or not he had her. So out she went. But aside from all that, I mean, that's just eh, people's lives in the pandemic, right? <laughs> so yeah, I, I yeah, feel like everyone has all these. They're all trapped in this one building, aren't they? <laughs> and they've all got to deal with each other. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's pandemic, very pandemic focused. <laughs> it's very pandemic short story. Everyone's all trapped together. They got to figure out how to how to work things out, how to gain their peace. And and I thought it would be interesting if the ghosts really didn't want to leave. That they didn't want peace. They wanted to hang out and have fun together. So that's what they're gonna do. And hopefully there will be sequels and prequels. <laughs> It was oh, incredibly yeah. well done, Danielle, and um, it was just so clever the way it all pulled together. So um, that is our authors, that's the stories. Um, if everybody else now, if you'd like, you can turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones. If anyone has a question, um, just let me know. Um, I have one question um, that came up, came to mind when I was um, listening to you all, and that's what do you think about ghosts? Are you afraid of ghosts? Would you like to meet a ghost? Have you ever met a ghost? Paula? Yeah, okay. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I've i always, you know, sort of, I did have an experience once, um, not long after my dad had died. And um, actually, I think it was the same night we went seen him off sort of I wouldn't say buried him but we didn't bury him we cremated him and um I came back to my mum's flat to stay with her that night and some strange things were happening like the door shutting and um you know just odd things happening but um the further I've got away from that the less I believe it you know at the time I was convinced um that it was my dad and doing I could, I could sort of like picture him shutting this door and just say, you know, look, you do it like this. And my dad would have, um, that's the sort of way my dad would have, you know, done something, um, demonstrated how you do something, you know, you do it like this. And, um, but ever since then, I, I've kind of not really thought too much about it. And um, I, you know, I used to watch Most Haunted religiously I, you know, until I realised it was all fake. Um, but I, I, I believe that, you know, some people that I know, they've told me um, their, their own sort of personal stories about ghosts and the paranormal. And I, I tend to sort of believe that whatever they've experienced, they believe they've experienced. But I can't actually believe in ghosts until I've experienced it myself, that I can actually say, yeah, I'm convinced. I mean, you know, the, the situation with my dad, my father didn't have a lasting effect on me. Okay, um, 
can I just pause yeah. you, Paula? Because Kim's got to go. So she's going to yeah, yeah. take yeah. off. So, so that, just say bye-bye anyway. to Kim and thank you for joining us. <laughs> oh, thanks for doing this. Well done, everyone. It was <laughs> fun. Bye. Bye. Okay. Sorry, Paula. <laughs> yeah, no, that I, that was it, really. I, I, and, unless I actually experience floating um, images and things that talk to me from the grave or whatever, I'm, I can't actually really say that I believe in ghosts. Mm. Um, I can only believe that other people have these experiences that they believe. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'd quite. I mean, it'd be quite nice to sort of, hit, you know, get a sign or something from somebody, but. I'm not really sure that um, you know, that would convince me. <laughs> no, I have to say, I don't want to believe in ghosts. I don't want to see a ghost ever. <laughs> I've always been interested. I, I'm, I'm a cowardly custard. I don't want to see a ghost. <laughs> I, I quite enjoy it. I mean, one of the most scariest films I've ever seen is an old black and white film called The Innocence with Deborah Carr. Oh, it's terrifying. Know. Oh, I love that film. I absolutely Yeah, but it's terrifying. Yeah, it's it terrifying. terrified me. I was a kid when I saw it. And uh, I'm glad it, I wasn't the only one that suffered through ghosts. I'm as glad a kid. somebody else remembers it. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I I mean I grew up in a family where like ghost stories and ghost films, etc. Um, my family loved those things. And the Christmas was a real thing because like every Christmas there used to be a late night ghost story of some kind. It was often a Charles Dickens thing. I think is it the railway man or the something like that? I can't remember what it's called. Yeah, it is. I can't remember what it's called now, but I can remember like watching it. And there were always these ghost stories and things. The original TV version of The Woman in Black is one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. It makes the modern film with Daniel Radcliffe, which was OK. But the original, the, the TV version of that was absolutely petrifying. Quite recently, I mean, within the last couple of years, I mean, my parents are both dead now, but I, I have such clear memories of sitting in a huddle on a Saturday night with various different ghost stories with my mum and my sister and my dad, you know, like all four of us wedged onto one sofa because it was so scary. I actually, I decided to go away and look up some of these films that I remembered and find out how young I was. And what I realised was that I had very progressive parents who thought that it really didn't matter what your kid watched at whatever age. Um, they, they were fabulous films, some of them, and some of them were black and white, some of them were slightly more modern. I had a real thing with ghost stories as a kid, which is probably why I like writing them. I, uh, at a certain age, and I mean, I would have been relatively young still, my mum put a ban on me getting ghost stories out of the library because I used to have such awful nightmares. Mm -hmm. My logical brain doesn't believe in ghosts, but I'm incredibly susceptible to spooky things. So even now, a spooky film or a spooky book or a spooky story that I read is likely to give me a nightmare while my brain says I know that's not real. So I'm one of those that I don't believe, but oh, wow, am I susceptible to getting scared by things. <laughs> Anyone else? I'll give you this. Jennifer? Oh, I, I don't... I don't believe specifically in ghosts. I'm very open-minded, though. It's not been disproved to me, so I'm, I'm open-minded. But I will give you this. I have never met one. I've heard of lots of unexplained things. But this morning, and this is not a ghost thing, but it's the unexplained to me. This morning, right, I have a PC in the living room and I have my laptop. My PC in the living room has a wallpaper of the caves at Matala. My laptop has a wallpaper of a Viking. Okay? I switched my laptop on this morning. It had the wallpaper of the caves at Matala. Mm. I cannot explain that. The two are not connected. I have never connected them. But this, well, that freaked me out this morning. Artificial intelligence is taking over, Simon. I tell you, they're talking to each other. They want to know why you're keeping them apart. That's what it is. They're thinking, Simon's it's keeping 5G. them apart. Why? Not to be 5G. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, must I, say, I live in the middle of nowhere. I get one gear to push. I looked up. Um, I, I need a new coffee maker. So I was looking it up on my Kindle on Amazon earlier. I turned my phone on, and all the adverts are of coffee makers. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Is your phone one of these that's um, done through the internet and not from? Yeah, the... I, th I think it's my router. I think the router is listening to us. 
Well, yes, it is. Mm. <laughs> the Amazon goblins. The Amazon <laughs> goblins sit in everything that you have. Yep. It's yeah. not only the Amazon ones, it's all the goblins. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah, mine um, yeah. um mine was in Grey Kirkyard up in Edinburgh. Um and it was it was absolutely terrifying i i am very susceptible uh, like lynn was saying it i'm i'm quite easily spooked um but it was quite early in the morning i was the only person around uh there was a, there was one guy sat on a bench i don't know if you know greyfriars kirkyard you walk in from where i have if you're the only person there it means the drunks that are usually there at that time of morning are found somewhere else <laughs> This this guy was he looked fine. He was in bright blue jacket. He was over there, not a problem. So I was taking a nice picture of a squirrel, and um, all of a sudden I felt a tug on my bag, and I was just like, okay, turned round, and there was this very tall gentleman in a white shirt, black suit, black hat, and when I turned around properly, nowhere to be seen. And the guy in the blue jacket was still exactly where he'd been. And it was just so vivid. I got out there so quickly. And <laughs> yes. You were not seeing me for dust. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was terrifying. As I did what any rational person would do, I rang my mum. And I was like, I've just seen a ghost. So, yeah. You do all realise I'm not going to sleep tonight now. <laughs> <laughs> you did this to me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> How about you? Are you scared of ghosts or? Me. Samantha. Put your microphone on. <laughs> I know, I was going to say, I'm all muted and completely unprepared <laughs> over here. Um, no, I'm really not. I, I guess I just don't believe in ghosts. I, I think that most of most things can be explained away somehow. I've, I've never... I've never heard a story of a ghost that's actually made me think, oh, goodness, maybe they are real. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I, Jen was pretty convincing. So I might change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think after Jen, I'd change my mind. What about you? Do you believe in ghosts or have you seen one? Kate? Oh, sorry. I was reading the comments down the side of the screen. <laughs> um, I, no, I, I, I don't know. I don't really believe in ghosts. I think I, I imagine a lot of things. You know, if you go to some nice spooky place, you know, like ruins of a castle or, or caves and things by the seaside and all that sort of thing, you can imagine things. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not seeing ghosts, but I think it's my vivid imagination that, you know, brings all sorts of things, people that may, may have been there alive, if you know what I mean in my head but it's not ghosts i'm just i just live in the past most of the time i think <laughs> i agree i think it's the atmosphere more than anything else yeah. yes i think so it's like walking through somewhere at night and hearing the wind and that or as with danielle going to the local hotel by the sound of it <laughs> <laughs> Like, I no, can't remember been there. They should. Yeah. You haven't. Oh, you have to go. You have to let us know if there really are ghosts there. <laughs> right. Oh, there's a lot of places in Grass Valley I, I haven't been, and I don't know why. I spend most of my time uh, graveyard hunting, <laughs> and you know they're all very unique because this area was uh, part of the gold rush. So, I mean miners came here and they died here too so there's a lot of towns that no longer exist but their graveyards are here so if you oh, go in the forest i mean you're bound to find right. one or two yeah, and sometimes they're marked sometimes <laughs> they're not but there's a lot of interesting ones out there just randomly stuck in the trees so oh, oh there i wouldn't say I don't believe in ghosts. I sometimes get weird feelings around there. It could be anything, but I just, I just like going to these graveyards. I don't know why. I'm a, I'm a graveyard fan as well. It's a tragedy. Aren't I? So what? What is everybody? Yeah, only in daylight. <laughs> I won't go at night. Yeah. Only in daylight. <laughs> what is everybody's spookiest historic place that they've been to? 
I I, I, I I went recently to Highgate Cemetery. Oh yeah. And um, I did well. It didn't um, feel spooky, which were, I was mm. quite disappointed. But um, yeah. I can imagine over night time it might do. There's a story about um, the um, Highgate Cemetery vampire, apparently. So I yeah. Can imagine, yeah. I mean, it, it's such such a historic place, you know, with the old sort of angels and crypts yeah. and catacombs, catacombs. Um, mm. and um, it's a beautiful place actually. I found it really beautiful. Yeah, it's fabulous. <laughs> yeah, not not. Spooky, but, I did um, go to um. There's a church near me, uh, Bambra. It's called the Cat and Man oh, Church yeah. because um. Yeah. There was a wild cat killed a knight, and the knight killed the wild cat in the porch of this church. And I can't actually remember the name of the church. I think it's St. Peter's, but I can't remember exactly. Um, and I've been to it a good few times, but there was this one evening I went with my grandparents. I was about 13 or 14, and it was as it was getting dark. And I got all the way to the porch of the church, and I went, I'm not going in there. It, there's someone. <laughs> <It> just... <laughs> and I in the car and waited for them I would not go in and that's the only time I've had that feeling where it's like no <laughs> it's not for me I don't know what's in there but I'm not going in I think I think mine was the it's up at Master Moor um and you probably know it, Sharon, quite well, but I, yep. probably a lot of you have been up there. I went, I was still a student and one of my, well, my best friend at uni actually lived up on the North Yorkshire Moors. And um, so I spent a lot of time up there when I was young and we were actually studying the Civil War, weirdly enough, at the time. And there, there are certain points up there. I mean, she told me these various ghost stories which exist up there of people like local farmers and local people that live in the area of hearing marching feet and like the wounded coming back from the battle, etc. And I'd heard all these stories and I'd read them all and, and, and none of it really had much of an impact. But I can remember we were doing a bit of a, a sort of tourist thing. She was driving and we were going to various different historic places and we'd been to a nice local pub for lunch. And we went to the Master Moor Memorial and it was late on a, a sort of wintry afternoon. So it was just at that stage where it was starting to get dark when we stood up there looking at the memorial. And there's a few places up there that if you walk to the right spot, you really can't see much evidence. Even though it's quite close to the road, you can't see much evidence of modern life. And there was that whole sense of everything that had happened up there and all the dead. And I mean, there, was no, there were no ghosts involved. But I can remember thinking, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> I want out of here right now. I want to get in the car, go back, and get to the pub. You know. <laughs> I I don't I have uh, places. Don't creep me out that way and and turn me away. But I'm just I'm just sorry. I'm interrupting because I'm just following on from what. No, that's fine. Master Moore. Uh, yeah. Because I'm not far from Master Moore myself. And yeah. There's a village nearby called Ripley, um, mm -hmm. which was where the Ingleby family were, were who fought uh, at Master Moore. Uh, Trooper Jane Ingleby, look her up. She is an astounding character. Trooper Jane Ingleby. Um, but at, at Ripley Church, at the back of the church, um, there's a line of bullet holes in the wall where the survivors of Marston Moor were executed by the parliamentarians. Oh. And while places don't get me, that makes me, oh no, that's just a, you a chill. That's that's a bad place to stand and feel things. Yeah. 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 I think it's a bit like um like me with Corf Castle. I remember <laughs> I was Castle in Dorset and years ago and knowing that all these women have been incarcerated in, you know, kept there um by various like uh, King John and Henry the Third and people like that. Um and I was thinking Actually, what a horrible existence to be in this castle on the on the top of this very steep mound mm -hmm. um, over the village. And if you look out any of any window from the castle, all you can see is all the beautiful countryside rolling away from, in front of you, and you're kept there and can't get out. You know, it must must have been awful. Sort of like lockdown. Mm -hmm. Sorry, t Simon. Sort of like lockdown then. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm still hoping for a light at the end of the tunnel. I suppose they were as well. But I, 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 when I found out that 
you know, that was, you know, that, uh, they were these, I don't know an awful lot about Corf Castle. It's just what I remembered reading when we <coughs> went there. And I'm thinking, actually, I, could, I was wandering around those ruins and thinking, God, they must have, they must have been so depressed and unhappy and all the rest of it, you know, real ghost material there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, um, because Corf Castle is one that they're not really sure where she is, but I think of Maud. Um, the the Browns. Browns. Yeah. That's what yeah, I remember it for. Yeah, there were two different places, and I don't remember where the other one was. One was Corf and I don't know where the other one was. Sharon? There were two. There were two places they thought that might have that she might have died, wasn't yeah. there? Um, it's I'm either Corf or Windsor, and yeah. no one knows which. Um, there's just because it possibly be of, Windsor. Well, even at Corf, there were um, John imprisoned some Breton soldiers there, and he forgot to feed them as well. So he okay. sort of had a track record for it. A bit of a pattern, really. Yeah. Are you sure, sure he forgot? He accidentally forgot on purpose. <laughs> I well, don't know. How it was the now. You can't. You can't say for certain whether. I mean, it wasn't his personal duty to feed them, um, but the guards were either told Most... to feed them or weren't given the money to feed them, sort of thing. So. <laughs> well, we're told not to feed them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I quite like to go to Transylvania Castle. Oh, my God. I must say, what? speaking of Dracula, the other one that gives me, that always gives me a spooky impression is, well, when um, I was at primary school, the last year of primary school, we always did, it was, you know, the school week away, you go away with school, and they took us to Whitby. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> with a view of the abbey, and then told us the story of Dracula and sent us to bed. <laughs> I've been there. I've, had, I've I've been. Um, I had the pleasure of being that night. No there. one slept. <laughs> yeah, had the pleasure of sleeping, being able to sleep at Whitby uh, Abbey and Corf Castle. Uh, wow. was doing reenactment. Mm. Because uh, obviously, Did you when sleep you do reenactment, I wouldn't have slept. <laughs> no, be a thing. But it, yeah, very atmospheric. Mm, yeah, one of those things that I love to be able to tell people. That... Right, I think we're going to wind down uh, now because it's getting nearly half past eight and it's nearly Simon's bedtime. <laughs> Oh, it's been great though. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's been fabulous. Shall we do a giveaway, guys? Shall we give away an ebook to the people who've listened in? To Sounds one great. person. I've got all the names down. I've given each a number, if you can see. So what uh -huh. I will do on my phone, I have got a random number generator set up. Sharon, take my number, my name off the list, please, because I've already got my copy. All right, Cathy, so we'll go numbers cool. one to eight. Oh, you messed up all my numbering now, Cathy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I've got the number one to eight to generate. It's going to go with um, generate. Oh, John, it, John's got a copy. One. It's Libby. Oh, thank you. Oh, oh. Thank you. <laughs> welcome, Libby. So I will sort that out with um paula at the end and um i've got your email address i think so we'll sort out thank you very much you have yeah. send you over the prize um as soon as i work out how to do it okay <laughs> <That's> fine <laughs> thank you i'll thank have you. a look tomorrow Should a big thank you to everyone i've started to read it yesterday i finished simon's and i've started on kim's journey and simon's gave me the creeps it kept me awake last night i was looking <laughs> out for some dark <laughs> very creepy women so uh, i gave you the creeps <laughs> take that as revenge for you being in carcassonne which was where i would really like to be well i can see the city right there illuminated in the distance right from where i sit so uh, that thing's very you, off let me know Cass Cass i think we should all go to Carcassonne because I want to go as well. Yes, I want to go. I and it's beautiful. I love Carcassonne. I have been there. It's lovely. It's fabulous. Yeah, it's gorgeous. I was there when I was 14. I bought a sword. I broke the sword and I left. Oh, no. You have to come back. 
definitely want to go. That. We'll have to do a historical forum writers trip there. Absolutely, <laughs> and I'll show you around all the castles and places. Absolutely, yeah, that sounds fabulous. You, you'll be sorry you said that, Kathy. When we all depend <laughs> on you. No, I'll enjoy it. <laughs> Lots of ideas. <laughs> Right, well let done. me just look at make sure we haven't got any messages on the messages. Uh, yeah, John Kane, just... so far I've just read Lynn's, but tonight has prompted me to read the others. <laughs> Get reading the others, John. They are awesome. Um, there are some fabulous stories in there. Um, uh, MJ Porter, thanks for joining us. And she has her copy. So everybody, um, I do hope you all do get the book if you haven't got it already, because it is well worth reading. Um, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, um, the foreword is fabulous as well, because that was done by me. Well, it's the best <laughs> bit, I mean, honestly. <laughs> well, it was the well, best it, it. it really reminded me of um, the way Lord Byron and everybody um, decided to do this competition as to who, did, who writes the best horror story. And it just... I remember it just rang with me about the way we'd done it, saying, let's do a ghost story. And just, just that was the um, brief. It wasn't, you need to do a ghost story that does this, this and this. It was, write a ghost story. And everybody came up with such different fabulous <coughs> ghost stories. Yeah, that was really interesting. Cool. It was the differences. It was very much was so. Very much. So thank you very Maybe much. Maybe next time you'll join us. Thank um, you. Yeah, well, say good night, and Libby, we will sort your prize out. Congratulations. And Thank you. Congratulations. Can we just say, raise a glass to everyone? Congratulations on the really fabulous book. And, and to Nadia for her <laughs> debut. Um, yeah. yeah. Well done, everyone. Yeah. Well done, everyone. Thank you very much. Right. Lovely to see you all. Lovely to see you all. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still here. Goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. Everyone. I, I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs>